Warning, this episode contains adult language and adult humor. Since when have trumpet players ever been considered adults? If you are easily offended by these types of conversations, consider switching to the oboe. Welcome to the Trumpet Gurus Hang Podcast. I'm your host, Jose Johnson. My guest for this episode is Jose Sabaja. Jose is an amazing talent. Since his first performance as a featured soloist at the age of 17, Jose has built a varied and successful career for himself. Whether it was playing in front of thousands while on world tour with Ricky Martin, performing classical repertoire in concert halls with the Boston Brass, or teaching one-on-one in his position at Vanderbilt University, Jose's love for music rings out in everything he does. So pour yourself a big glass, pull up a chair, and let the hang begin. Welcome to this episode of the Trumpet Gurus Hang. I'm your host, Jose Johnson, and I am joined today by uh, my namesake, uh, world-famous trumpet player uh, and man of uh, a wonderful hairstyle, unlike me, Mr. Jose Sabaja. What's happening, Jose? Hey, man. How are you? Thank you for having me. Thank you for for opening up this space uh, for us uh, trumpet players, man. Um, um, just it is a pleasure to see you a pleasure to hear you man and and just happy to be here oh thanks man thanks it's uh you know part of the idea with this this show is that not every and especially now um not everybody has the pleasure of doing hangs and uh i think we first met at itg in columbus which funny enough is my hometown and uh you know we we kind of Met, same name, hanging out, uh, talking, had lunch together a few times and stuff like that. And it was just, you know, that's the kind of stuff that I think uh, a lot of people just, you know, you really need to be able to experience that because the best way to learn uh, about people is just to spend time talking and and just in that casual space. So that's what we want to try and do today is, is let people get to know you and what you're about and where you're going. And, and um, so uh, the first thing I want to do is I'm going to start out by congratulating on congratulating you on your position at Vanderbilt. So I haven't seen you since that. So um, so let's just start there, man. How did that come about? And, and uh, you know, that, it, that's, that seems to be a, an interesting transition for you, uh, you know, getting more into that educational space. So, you know, tell us a little bit about it. I was, um, my predecessor at Vanderbilt, Alan Cox. I knew Alan from from uh, my days as a teenager at, at Swanee Summer Music Center, and he taught he taught me there for a summer, and we stayed in touch. And um, so he, when he was about to retire, he was doing these sessions of people that he he thought you know it'd be great for his students to listen to and 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 have a chance to whatever hang out with. So. He invited me to go down to Vanderbilt, uh, so I went and I did a recital, play a recital, and then I I, um, I did a master class, and and that was it. And then I, I just went home, um, and probably two or three months after that, I got a call from the dean of the school, asking me if you know they they. Trump, the trombone professor, um, and and himself, they had seen my master class, and they were interested in talking to me. Uh, so we met, we met in Kentucky actually. They came out, and I was on tour. We met, and we talked, and uh, they asked me if I was interested in in teaching at Vanderbilt. Uh, if that would be something that I that I was interested in. um so I, I talked to him, I said, you know, I, I've never thought of that. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, I thought I would be teaching by later in, in my life, you know? Um, so uh, it seemed to me like it was a, it was a great, great uh, opportunity for me to, to pay back a little bit of, of all the love I've received from people, from teachers, from, from the trumpet community. Um, so that's how that came about. Um, here I am, this is, I think just five or something like that. And, um, so I moved from Florida and, um, it's, it's been great, man. I mean, 
people here in Nashville are so welcoming. The the recording industry community has been really, really welcoming to me. Um, so I have found a new home. Uh, the, the university is great. It's fantastic. I have a fantastic group of colleagues that I work with. And um, it's just, you know, it's just something that basically I wasn't really looking in, looking into yet, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, I, I guess I was just fortunate enough to be able to to transition into that like that, you know. Um, yeah. Especially in a place like this. Yeah. Well, you know, that's the way it works sometimes, man. The 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 greatest things uh, happen to us when we're not looking for them. So, you know, you can just be kind of relaxed and, and let things unfold. So, uh, I mean, it sounds like a wonderful opportunity. And uh, I've heard nothing but great things about the program in Vanderbilt to begin with. I was there once, maybe about, uh, I don't know, seven, eight years ago. And uh, yeah, it's a beautiful campus. And, uh, you know, when I get down there, which I will, I've got a nephew who just moved there. I'm going to make sure I look you up. And that's uh, right, man. And, Let's get uh, some hot chicken. Yeah, there you go. Some hot hot chicken sandwiches, man. Got to do that thing. Got to do it right. All right. So you you said that you were on the uh, on tour when you um, had the meeting. Is that uh, with with Boston Brass? With Boston Brass, yeah. We were we were playing in Kentucky, and um, I had the meeting with them there. Uh, we're in the middle of a tour here. In the Midwest, and uh, that's how that came about. Mm. Yeah. Now, I mean, obviously, with COVID, uh, touring is a a thing of the past. Uh, but when you were touring with with uh, the brass, uh, like how many dates a year were you guys typically doing? Uh, it it you know, it varied. We, we would go. It was around one hundred and thirty, one hundred and forty days out of the year. Sometimes it would be more. So that would be one hundred and sixty. Um, but you know, it, it's, it's quite, quite some time we were out there. Um, I, 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 I really miss that part. You know, it's been five months, man. Yeah. And, and cause you get to meet so many people, you get to talk to so many people. And, and, uh, the, what I really enjoy when, when, when we go out there or when I go out there and do things on my own is to be able to leave a, a footprint. You know, educationally, whatever I, I go or we go. So the aspect of teaching uh, in master classes is something that I miss too um, from, from being on the road, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it's kind of interesting because uh, you've done a lot of touring, obviously. Uh, you know, for, for those who don't know uh, Jose's uh, history, uh for you were what for five years you were were with uh, Ricky Martin, nine years. Ooh man, even, even longer. Uh, so you, you you've gone from playing like the the and that was kind of at the height of his career too, right? The like the Living La Vida Loca time stuff like that. So you went from playing like coliseums to uh, you know playing uh, you know uh, concert halls and smaller you know venues with with Boston Brass and and, and with your uh, solo performances. Um, yeah, when you when you have that kind of that huge difference between the audiences and, and in the case like when you're with Ricky, you're you know, you're part of the band and, you know, the trumpet geeks are going to, you know, dig what you're doing as opposed to when you're with uh, Boston Brass, where these are instrumentalists. These are people that are there to hear that particular style of music and appreciate brass playing. So um, what what kind of mindsets did you have to go through to adjust from going from that uh, being part of this huge performance to being into a more intimate setting uh, and how that dealt with your, how that changed their level of interaction with, with your audience? Yeah. Um, I think that um, when I was playing, before I played with Ricky Martin, I played principal trumpet when I was about 19 years old in the National Symphony Orchestra in Venezuela. They hired me to go down there. So I did that for two and a half years. Then I started steering a little bit away from the classical world. I started, you know, trying to to play more in a different different styles. And, you know, I, I, I was fortunate enough to end up playing with a mega star like that. Um, so I learned a lot. 
you know, not only musically, but I learned a lot about the music business. I learned a lot about, about people. You know, that people, we're all the same, man. You know, people want to hear good music regardless, you know. And, and um, but I, I came to the realization that I needed to, to, you know, how people have, some people like being uh, employees of a company. Right. Right. Some other people like to be entrepreneurs. And some other people like to have their own business, you know. So I, I came to the real realization that for me, it was important to try to make a name for myself in order to be able to have a future as a trumpet professor some, some, sometime mm -hmm. and try to leave, leave that, that, that mark, that legacy. And also, uh, in order to try to, to increase my brand name and try to become more, more um, what's the word? Well, more, I guess, like more of a sale. I don't know. I, you know, I actually be more, more. Uh, what's the word, man? Well, you're, yeah, more. I, I just, I can, not even in Spanish. I remember. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. You know, yeah, you, yeah. You have your own brand, and to be yeah. more present. Yeah. Um, as as you as being you, you know, you, yeah. you being the person that is that, that is highlighted, and right. that'll, that will reflect in your future a lot more. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I I wasn't. I I didn't really want to become climb the ladder of being like the musical director of a pop group or or starting producing pop music or doing any of that. At that point, I wasn't interested in that. Mm -hmm. You know. I was mostly interesting in performing and being, being the best trumpet player I could be. Um, so I think that transition for my artistry was important, you know, because it would it would it would challenge a lot more of my trumpet playing. Uh, it would challenge a lot more what I did musically, um, and and that's why I took that turn. Um, I started playing both for like a month. And then um, I had to decide either I had to stay with Ricky Martin or I had to go on and, on and play um, with Boston Brass. So, yeah, so people might probably think that I'm crazy, but I, I decided to go with Boston Brass. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, you got to follow your heart, man. Yeah. And uh, I, so you said yeah, that, that you learned a lot of lessons uh, with Ricky um, about, uh, you know, just yeah, you know, the business in general. Uh, obviously, you, you one of the biggest lessons that you learned from him was the importance of proper hair care, uh, and uh, uh, you know you're, you've got the you know got the gel going on. So, uh, but um, I, I I think sometimes that's what you know people are so concerned with the technical aspect of trumpet playing, which obviously is very very important. But if you're going to make it as a professional there are completely different skill sets that you have to have. And, um, you know, it, it's hard to teach that stuff in a school. Sometimes the best lessons are just the ones you learn, you know, on the road and on the grind. So um, when you think about, uh, like, you know, the, the biggest lesson that you learned working with a, a pop star, which many people would look at that, there are many musicians that would look at that as being like, oh, if I could only do that, my career would be complete. Um, but what what do you think the biggest lesson that you got out of that was, whether it was something about the horn or something about the business or something about life in general? Well, the the biggest lesson that I got playing playing in that band was to to remain humble, man. Because the boss was like that, Ricky was like that. You know, he was he was this guy, the pinnacle of his career, world superstar. And he couldn't be any nicer and more simple of a human being. Yeah. So to me, that was a big example. That was the number one. Number two, he was such a hard worker. If there was anybody that worked hard, was that dude? You know, so people always people always see the the finished product, you know, yeah, and they don't they don't know what's behind it, right? So. 
Ricky was always working. Always working, man. Always working. Uh, that was the second lesson. And the third lesson, a uh, gigantic lesson, was that everybody's the same. Everybody wants to have a good time. It doesn't matter if you're from China or you're from Argentina or you're from the United States or you are black or you're white or you are purple or whatever, green, whatever color you are. Everybody wants to have a good time. You know? And music does that for people. Yeah. It doesn't matter what, what music you play. You know? Um, and probably one of the, also something really important that I, that I noticed and I got to to um, a very early age understand was that I was very fortunate. Yeah. I was a very fortunate person because I, my passion was to make music and I was making a living making music at a very yeah. early age. So, yeah. Yeah, well, that's a lot to be grateful for, you know? And uh, I think that, uh, I mean, just knowing your story just to the level that I do, um, that you are you're exceptionally grateful for the fact that you have the opportunity to use uh your gifts and something that's something that you love and that you've worked so hard to do that you be you're able to use it uh as a way of, of making your living but i think even more importantly because as you said earlier you know, your decision to, to leave ricky and to go with boston brass and uh you know now transitioning uh into your your role as a professor i know you're still working with boston, boston brass as well uh, but you're also willing to take the next step, understanding that sometimes to, to move forward, you have to leave some things behind. Uh, and that takes a lot of courage. So, um, you know, when you were making that, that transition uh, into uh, back into the world of classical, since that's, you know, kind of where you started and, and you migrated into pop and then back into classical, um, when you were when you're contemplating that decision uh besides the fact that you're trying to build your brand and your your own individual mark on the on the trumpet world um what were some of the other deciding factors for you that 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 made you go yeah this this is the route that, that i want to take or that i feel called to take at this moment well it was it was it was a very difficult decision because at that point in that band i had been Eight nine years at that band, in that band, and 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 those people were like family. You know, uh, I had the best relationship with, with with Ricky with their family. They're they're they're, they're just great people too. Um, so it was a difficult decision. It was just a professional decision. It was just a business decision, on my end. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, I think that when you are making a decision, you have to have a picture. A bigger picture than the moment that you are, what's happening right now, and you have to need to have a bigger picture where do where you want to go. Every time you make a decision, and this is probably more of a talk for the younger people, you know, if you have to make a hard decision in your life, you need to see yourself in five years, six years, ten years from that moment, and see where you want to be in life and what's gonna steer you down that way a lot more yeah you yeah. understand what i'm saying so oh uh, yeah 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 i mean I, i'm kind of wired that way to begin with you know and i'm always thinking it's almost like being a chess player and it's you know uh, you know here's where i want to be in five years ten years is this thing i'm doing now going to get me closer to that or further away from it and you know maybe that's that's uh, just the way my brain's wired or maybe it's just because i'm old uh, but either way, um, it's something that I see lacking in a lot of people. And, and is that something that in, you know, now that you're, uh, you're dealing more on a daily basis with young budding trumpet players, you know, people who want to become professionals, um, is that something that you're seeing that is lacking in those students? And, and if it is, you know, how do you go about, uh, encouraging them to to think a little bit more strategically about their decision making process. Well, I started the studio, you know, because I, I give them a lot of freedom in terms of, of not I don't give them freedom in in in, in etudes. Mm -hmm. I don't give them freedom in, in, in trumpet technique. I I give them a lot of freedom in repertoire. 
So when they choose a piece, and you know, and it does for X Y reason, uh, it doesn't work out for them. And I, I, my first thing to them is like, okay, well, go back, analyze why you chose that piece. Because you liked it, okay, great. Uh, and why else? Because I liked it. Well, then there's the wrong choice. You have to have. You you always have to have to. Life is too short. People say life is too short, but with life being that short, there is a lot of responsibility that comes with it. You have to try to kill two or three birds with one stone every time you make a decision. In my opinion. Yeah. So if I start doing long tones in the morning and I am not paying attention to the long tones I am playing in the morning because I am watching TV or I am reading the newspaper while I do long tones, I am wasting time. Because if I pay attention to what I'm doing, I'm going to be able to take take a lot more benefit because I am, I'm going to be analyzing the way I am producing the tone. I'm going to be analyzing what kind of articulation I'm using, how much articulation I'm using, how is my air, all of those things. And all, all of that thing applies to what I do on a, on a daily basis. So I think that, that, that um, in a way, life is the same way. Every time you make a decision towards something, you have to have, you know, you have to see how that affects in the path that you want to follow. You know, so I... My, I remember what I was going to say at the beginning, and then I forget. I never got, I got, my, my clutch got stuck. Uh, <laughs> marketable. Yeah. Yeah, that was the word I was looking for. So if you want to be marketable and you want to have a path that you want to follow, um, you need to start investing, putting money into that that bank account in order to follow that path. So if I am playing an exercise like like the Clark exercise for the regular things that we do for Clark exercise, you know, flow, being able to play in one breath, this and that, blah, blah, blah. I switch the exercise around. And I play slower. I play faster. I play double tongue. I, I, I play as loud as I can. I play really soft. So I have different uses for that exercise. Every, and every time I am doing something with the exercise, I have a, a purpose. That is not only the purpose that is given to me, but I'm looking for a second purpose. So decision-making in my life, man, I don't know why it's been easy for me. Maybe not always the greatest decisions, but they've been easy. You understand what I'm saying? We all make mistakes. But I think that had to do with my mom when I was a kid. She was very, okay, you make your own decision. Oh, I cracked my head. Well, you made the decision, didn't you? So in, in that way, I was very lucky because I was never super, super, my mom was never super protective of me in that sense. And that gave me a sense of, you know, being more aware yeah. of, of my surroundings. So it starts with that. I, I give, I, I start with the, with the, with the students that way, man. Mm -hmm. And I, I, tried, I, I tried to convince them that every decision they make, it has consequences, positive and negative ones. So you, they need to balance what it is that, that I know. I went on a long uh, tangent here, man. Oh, no, no, no. That, that's, that's good. That's I actually, when we hang, right? Yeah, exactly. You know what? I, I, I think we must have the same mom. We not only have the same name, but we have the same mom because my mom was exactly the same way. You know, she's, I, the, and for me, the most uh, one of the most defining moments in my life was I was about uh, 16 years old and uh, my mom was talking to me she goes you know your dad and I have tried our best to raise you in the best way possible we tried to teach you the difference between right and wrong uh, I want you to understand that whatever you do I'll always love you but whatever decisions you make they're your decisions and you're the one who has to deal with the consequences. So whoever you want to date and whoever you want to marry and whoever you want to hang out with, those are your choices. But, you know, if if you end up in jail, 
you're in jail and it's it's your fault so i love you but you're gonna stay in jail <laughs> yeah you're staying in jail because i'm not bailing you out <laughs> so and, and and it was funny because, you know, a lot of my friends and, you know, and over the years, people I've talked to, you know, parents who were like, so you can't do this, you can't do that. And they were so authoritarian. Uh, they were the ones that got in the most trouble. My mom just is like, you know, hey, you know, if you're going out, you do what you're going to do. You go where you want to go. But if you screw up, you know, you screwed up. And I had all that freedom, but I never really pushed it because I, I was always thinking, okay, well, if is this decision going to get me in into trouble? Is it going to create a bad thing for me in the long run? And yeah, sometimes I, I, it probably you know prevented me from experiencing some things that I would that I would have have liked to experience. But you know, in general, I'm happy with where I am. So that's right. Not only that, you're here, man. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. It, life is that simple, man. It's funny yeah. because life is that simple. Yes. Yeah. Hey, man. Either you're here or you're not. <laughs> it's so funny because people are like, "Well, this and that, and blah blah blah." Hey, man, it's pretty simple. Where do you want to be? Yeah, you want to yeah. be free. You don't. You, you don't want to be free. You want to be breathing. You don't want to be breathing. It's, it's up to you. Yeah, your, your choice, baby. Um, you know, uh, on your website, you have a saying that I love: "Is music is the voice of the heart." Um, where did you come up with that quote? Oh, I, I don't know. It's just something that I live, man. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what music is. Music is your heart speaking. Mm -hmm. You know, we go through all this trouble practicing the trumpet every day just to free our heart. So our heart has a voice, you know, uh, and that voice can come out. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's, it. that's just that I believe music is that. Music is the voice of the heart. Yeah. You know, if you have a beautiful heart, Probably the music that you make is going to be pretty beautiful. If your yeah. heart's not that great, probably it could be pretty impressive. But maybe not that beautiful. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I, oh, I, yeah. I, yeah it's, just, it's just something that, that I, I believe in. I just believe in that, you know? Yeah. Well, I, I talk a lot about the concept that, um, you know, it, art of any kind, whether it's music or graphic art, you know, drawing, poetry, whatever. It's about taking uh, the idea of the artist, their their intention and their feeling and reproducing it in a way that creates the same response in other people. And that, you know, like you're saying, it comes with the heart. So if there's an emotion, there's always an emotion attached to it. And that emotion may be joy, it may be love, it may be sorrow, it may be hate, it could be any emotion. Um, but it's it's trying to create that feeling. And the technique is the mental side of things. It's the you know the the mechanics, the the you know the, that technical side of things. And I think sometimes, particularly the the classical world has gotten a bad rap for this. That um, you know there's so much emphasis on being technically correct that there's no emotion or you know, limited emotion to the playing um i don't necessarily believe that's true but uh you know that that does sometimes come through in some players um so how do you help someone to uh to find that balance of uh the cerebral side of playing the the technical side of playing and then just allowing your head to get the hell out of the way so that your heart can really speak yeah, it's that's that's a really good question, man. And it's a tricky one. It's a difficult one to answer because there is so many elements that you need to have together for your product to be hearable. You understand what I'm saying? So yeah. if if I am always try myself trying to work on getting getting that vehicle, which is my trumpet playing as 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 fast as as powerful as 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 um as great as possible in order for me to 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 liberate my mind from that and concentrate in what i love to do which is singing so um for me it's very important as i only teach undergrads at school so for me for them to develop great fundamentals and some sort of uh, 
some sort of a way of controlling or having some sort of control for 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 the trumpet is very important. If you're not willing to pay those consequences, you may be able to talk to people, but you will always be frustrated. You understand what I'm saying? You may yeah. have a lot to say, and all of that, the rest of you have, that you have to say is going to stay inside. Yeah. Now, the opposite is, 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 is worse. But all you do is technique, 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 and you can't play a song, then you're in a lot of trouble. So I think it's important in everyday, everyday um, routine, every, every, everyday practice to allow sometimes for you to have a good time and sing with the trumpet. Yeah, you know? Of course, when you're playing repertoire, when you're playing all of these things, you need to be singing the whole time. Um, but when you're doing fundamentals, when you're doing all these things that are very mechanic, like, and, and then and very, you know, quote unquote, boring, um, you don't have that luxury. So it's important for you to have a melody or a, a book of melodies that you like, that you love to play, a hymn book, whatever it is that, that flows your boat. Play with the radio, I, whatever it is that you want to do that, that will get that side of you taken care of. And then when you can't do things that you'll understand, oh, okay, I got to do more of this, more of that, more of that, more of this, and, and, and develop a, a healthy habit, I think, you know? Yeah, yeah. I, I was, uh, a number of years ago, I, I attended a master class that Tim Hagens was doing. And, you know, Tim phenomenal improviser you know his 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 concepts are just way out there sometimes um but he was talking about the importance of free play as part of the daily routine and it's like you know don't think about a key signature don't think about changes don't think about time just play and whatever you feel let it come out so um, I, I think that's that's one of those things that sometimes is missing the the joy of playing because I mean you think about the word play what does it mean you know you're having fun you know so um, that that's a really cool concept that you have with that and and I like what you said about you know if you're playing something that you that you enjoy and you run into a wall a limitation, then that tells you what you need to work on. Exactly. So, yeah. It's, that's, pretty, that's, it's pretty obvious. It becomes really obvious very quickly. <laughs> hey, man, but... We've all been there, man. Yeah, but, you know, come on, we're trumpet players. We want to make it too hard. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so uh, you know, I was as I was reading through your, your bio, doing my research on you, stalking you, um, I saw, and I didn't know this about you, that you uh, did your solo debut at 17, which in and of itself is pretty impressive, but uh, you had also only been playing for five years. So that's, uh, you know, that that's kind of a big thing. That it, is music, has music always been a part of like your, your family? Uh, no, no, I, I, my, my family is soccer oriented, man. <laughs> Soccer was the big, big thing in my half family. I just took a liking, uh, you know, for the trumpet, and I, you know, uh, I, 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 you know, I fell in love with the trumpet, man. That's all, and I was just playing trumpet all day. Yeah. And I poor mom, poor my mom, poor my mom, man. She's, you know, she was like, "Okay, stop now <laughs> at one in the morning," you know. Yeah. So yeah. Well, it, yeah, I mean, and, and that's an interesting question, though, because um, I, when I was younger, I, and I still do, I still love to play the trumpet, but when I was a kid, um, trumpet was my love. And, you know, if I was having a good day, I wanted to, first thing I wanted to do when I got home was go to my room and get out my horn and, and play. And if I was having a bad day and I wanted to feel better, the first thing I did was go into my room, get out my horn to play, to feel better. But when I started playing professionally uh, and, you know, it was like working every night, I got to a point where it was work and I couldn't go to the horn for my joy anymore because if I was frustrated playing on the job, I, you know, it's just the last thing I wanted to do was to look at that horn. 
Um, now I've, I've learned ways of, of dealing with that for myself later on in life, but uh, have what, you, what, do, what do you do? Well, what I do now is, I mean, because I, I, my playing is semi pro now or part time. It actually, it's no time now since there's no gigs, but, um, because I'm no longer reliant on playing, uh, for, to make my living, I can enjoy it a little bit more. I actually came back to playing because I was doing something else that, that I loved. I started my own martial arts business and that's what I loved. But, and that was a and lesson for that, everybody listening out there. Messing around with Jose is not a good idea. He just yeah. said he just started his martial arts. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that, that was 30 years, man. That was 30 years of work there. Now, but now you're like a super sen or whatever you call it, man. Yeah, that's it. But uh, no, but 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 that was a lesson that I learned was that because I love doing martial arts and I was doing it as you know, I was running a school. I had 13 employees, you know, you know, a couple hundred students uh, every month. I you know, taught thousands of people all around the world. Um, but what I learned was that because this is something that I love, that I got into a business, I needed to make sure I had another outlet. Um, and what I figured out was uh, it was less about what I was doing and why I was doing it. And I'm a very creative person. I'm an expressive person. So I have to have something that challenges me intellectually, but also has that emotional connection to it. So. For me, doing music and doing martial arts, and, and now my focus is mostly on like coaching and consulting people for uh, personal development, uh, it's all the same thing. They're just different. It's like the difference between playing a piccolo trumpet and a flugelhorn. You know, uh, I'm still trying to do the same thing. So for me, that's the way I keep my balance of everything. But for you, I mean, how do you cre keep that balance of, of doing something as a profession and still keeping that that childlike love for what you do. Hey man, just you, you just talk to my wife, man. She says she, <laughs> she says I got the Peter Pan syndrome. <laughs> I never grew up, and I think she's right. Yeah. You know, I I I I wake up every day, man, and if I don't play the trumpet during the day, I get in a bad mood. It's just something that I love. You know, I I really love playing the trumpet. I really love the fact that it's such a tricky instrument. That it, 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 every day poses a different challenge, you know? And then once you think that you have everything figured out, it'll bite you in the butt. And then you're like, okay, <laughs> you know? It's, so to me, that's really interesting. I, uh, I, I get bored easily. So the fact that the trumpet, it's, it's, it's such a, it, I mean, it's it's a beautiful instrument, but you know, it's very demanding, and it will it will demand a lot of attention from you. Mm -hmm. uh, to to me, that's that's really really uh, interesting. You know, uh, the, the, I've never considered what I do a job. I'll say, you know, I mean, uh, and this sounds cliche or whatever, but. It's, it's, I enjoy doing what I do, man. Yeah. You know, I, and I really came to terms during this pan pandemic, man. Um, I am not, I am not okay not performing. I love performing. I have a great time when I perform. And sometimes it goes fantastic. And sometimes it doesn't. And I still have a great time. You know, I, 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 and that's another thing that when we go back to talking about people that are very rigid and they, their music doesn't really flow. Um, I stopped caring about making a mistake a long time ago. If I miss a note or if I, something goes wrong with the trumpet, so what? Who cares? I'll prepare to play, play the best I can, but if something goes wrong, something goes wrong, man. I never heard a trumpet player in my life ever that has played perfect anything. Never. And yeah. I've heard a lot of trumpet players in my life. You know? Who cares? So, once I started realizing that, to me, it even became even more joyful to play. More of an enjoyment. So, 
yeah. And now it's funny because I, I, I enjoy practicing more than I used to. Yeah. It's just, it's, 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 I don't know, man. It's like a bad drug. I don't know. <laughs> well, I, you know, I, I think um, it's a concept that, that, that um, I refer to as, as uh, chasing the process and not the perfection. Yeah, a lot of people are, are just, uh, you know, they want things to be right. They want them to be perfect. Uh, and that's where they find their joy. And you're never going to be joyful because you're never going to be perfect. But if you fall in love with the process, the, you know, if, if you learn, uh, one of the things I always tell people is like to become comfortable being uncomfortable. Because when you're practicing, that's what you're doing. You're pushing your boundaries. You're, you're trying to do things that you can't do. You're trying to learn things you don't know. And that is innately uncomfortable to us. But when you fall in love with that process, then practice becomes something completely different. It's, it's an experience. It's a growth. So, you know, I, I feel you on that, man. And I like to share with people, too, that my, my view in life is we didn't come to this world to be always right and to be perfect. We're not here for that. If, if somebody has, or, the, or society has put that into our mind, then it's our job to get rid of it. Because we're, nobody's perfect. Right. And, and if you are trying to be perfect or something, like you said, you're never going to be happy because you're never going to be perfect. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a fact. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the flip side of that is that, that, that uh, there is a level of perfection in that, you know, everything is perfect based upon the amount of work that you put into it. You know, it, you know, it, it, if, if you, if you put a hundred percent into it, then whatever you give is going to be the perfect example of that. If you've only put 50% in, you know, it, it's not going to be any better than, than what you, you, you invested in it. So, yeah. I think to me, it's important also, Jose, if, if I finish one night, you know, when I, when we, when we were able to play, <laughs> when we had shows and we had concerts in the good old if, days <laughs> yeah if a person comes up to me and says hey thank you this and that i it made me feel a certain way i am going home happy because i did my job my job's not to be a great trumpet player or a bad trumpet player or a half ass trumpet player or whatever my job is to make somebody feel something. There you go. That's my job as a performer. There you go. Something. So if, if I made somebody feel something that night, hopefully I made everybody feel something. But if I do one person that exteriorizes it, I feel like the, you know, the luckiest person on earth, man. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So it's, 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 it took me a while to get there. But look, thankfully, I did get there. I, I had a, I had a, a long period of time of of uh, darkness, meaning where I was expecting everything to go right, and everything I was expecting, you know, the impossible. You know, once I I stopped expecting the impossible, it was a liberation, and mm -hmm. I really started enjoying music ten times more than 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 I used to. Is there one thing that you could point to and say, this is kind of the, the point where I made that, or this is the thing that, that helped me to understand that better? When I started touring, touring with Ricky Martin, um, uh, even when I was in the orchestra in Venezuela, man, it, um, it, I, it was, I was very rough on myself, very hard on myself. Uh, but then I started touring with Ricky Martin. I think it sort of took a different perspective because I started seeing the big picture of, of, of what what entertainers did. And I don't care if you're Joshua Bell or you are Ricardo Muti or you are uh, Luciano Pavarotti or whoever, whoever you are. You're an entertainer. Yeah. You want to call you. You may want to call yourself an artist or whatever you want to call yourself. At the end of the world, at the end of the day, you're another entertainer. That's it. Yeah. So when I saw that, that the bigger picture, 
you know? I was like, people don't care if I'm missing out or not. People care if they go home bored or they go home not feeling something. Yeah. You know? Then when you turn when you turn into into the so called serious type of playing, um, it's it's less less permissible uh, for for you to make mistakes. But because we have created that image in our head. I'd rather hear somebody go mm. play a concert and crack a bunch of notes, but say something very meaningful. That somebody play a spotless, clean, perfect performance, and me falling asleep during it. Yeah, you know, and that's life. If mm -hmm. you think about life, it's the same thing, man. How do you want to live your life? Yeah. You know, I want to I want to live things responsibly, but I want to live things. I yeah. don't want to, you know, be in a cocoon in my house and, you know, not see yeah. anything. Yeah. Well, of course, that's where we are now. So That's right. <laughs> and, I don't and, want that. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And uh, yeah, I, I, that that's that is such a profound statement because, uh, you know, going back to that idea of the of the heart, um, you know, when you're when you're trying not to make mistakes, when you're so worried about making mistakes uh, that, you know, that creates a, a level of tension in your subconscious that's going to prevent what you can what you can really do from coming out. Um, I mean, I remember like the first time that I sat down and listened to uh, Freddie Hubbard and I'm listening to Freddie play and just some of the cracks that he came up with. I mean, he, he missed stuff all over the place, but man, you felt it when he played, you know, it was, and then, you know, going back and, you know, obviously it's in like the miles and to, and to some of the other guys like Woody Shaw that I really enjoy their playing that are, they were, they were so experimental. They were so uh, innovative in their time. And by the nature of innovation, you're pushing the boundaries and because they're trying to do things that, that not only no one else has done before, that they've never done before, you're, you're going to miss. And it's that willingness to take chances. And that, to me, that's, like you said, that's life, man. you got to be willing to take some chances. And if you play the trumpet and you're not willing to take chances, play the piano, switch to something else. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Yeah, yeah. Because this instrument, it is not a given. Not that the piano is a given, but at least you see the note, you play the note. This instrument's not like that. Yeah. You know? And then also something something that 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 really in my life, man, is something that also I, I came to a, a realization was that I am not trying to be perfect. I am trying to be better than I was yesterday, if I am lucky. If not, yeah. it's all good too. Yeah, <laughs> understand what yeah. I'm saying. Yeah, I'm saying, I got you. I, I, you know, and if people out there, they're like, "Oh man, he's so like uninspiring," you know. Yeah, sorry, that's just reality. You know, it, it, it just makes for a healthier life, mentally and physically. And your music, I think that your music will be a lot more more uh, true to who you are. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And that's the sign of an artist right there. Uh, I want to ask you a quick question because um, I mean, like for classical, I mean, the, everybody can kind of come run down a list of like, you know, who are the, the you know, the influential classical players. Uh, but I think for a lot of people, unless they grew up uh, listening to Latin music, they're, they don't know like where to go, you know, who, who are the resources, who are the people that they should listen to? Uh, and like, what are the critical skills that you need to be, you know, a, a, a solid Latin music player? Wow, man. Uh, well, of course, I mean, I, myself, I grew up listening to Arturo Sandoval, you know, uh, Arturo is, is still in daily inspiration to all of us you know he's been inspiring us forever man so of course listen to Arturo I used to love Claudio Roditi mm -hmm. Claudio Roditi's playing was fantastic 
Now, there is a guy by the name uh, Luis Ortiz, Perico Ortiz. He's from Puerto Rico. Oh, he's another a great, great, fantastic trumpet player. Uh, there is a guy named Elias Lopez, also, that is, that was from Puerto Rico. Juancito Torres from Puerto Rico. Uh, uh, Jorge Barona from Cuba. People, these people, unfortunately, Jorge Barona passed away. Um, who, who else, man? I mean, you have Luis Aquino, of course, my good friend Luis Aquino, uh, who, who is a great lead trumpet player. Um, yeah, man. There, there is a, 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 a Chocolate Armenteros from Cuba. Uh, yeah, I mean, right now you have this guy named El Indio, who is, who is from Cuba too. Julio Padron from Cuba, Alexander Abreu uh, from Cuba. So there, there is there is like a legacy of trumpet player Raúl Agras from Venezuela, a legacy of trumpet players from different regions of Latin America that have been or are still um, pl playing great trumpet and, and especially in, in, in Latin music, in that style, you know. Um, the Pete Rodriguez, uh, Mike Rodriguez, uh, in New York, um, these these guys are just phenomenal trumpet players and, and 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 phenomenal artists. You know that. So if you want to take a take a listen to those guys, I'm sure I'm leaving some people out. I am sorry. I apologize, but uh, but that's that's you know whoever comes to mind right now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because like you know, if you if you try to ask a, a a jazz person, you know, like yeah, hey, I'm interested in jazz trumpet. You know, who should I listen to? Yeah, you're gonna get the rundown. You know, okay, you need to listen to the Miles and Dizzy and you know, uh, you know, and and I think that um, that's one thing that I have noticed that there there's really been no uh, very strong public kind of. Here is the the lineage of of uh, Latin trumpet playing, and and here are the here are the the people that have set the standard at different periods of its evolution. So that might be a good project, uh, you know, uh, for for somebody out there listening who has a, a good knowledge of uh, Latin music history, uh, and you maybe can talk to uh, uh, Professor Sabaha and get some uh, credits for your your work for that. All right. So uh, here's what we're going to do. We're going to um, we're going to wind down the interview portion. And uh, at the end of every interview, what I do is I do a speed round with my guest in which I ask a variety of questions that go from uh, topic to topic, not all related to music. And uh, all I want is your quickest and uh, best answer. Uh oh. And uh, I've already finished my tequila, so I'm sorry. Oh, my um, God, man. I didn't even notice. I thought you were uh, drinking water. Uh, yes, uh, it's water uh, with with some agave. Uh, <laughs> yeah, processed water, processed water, exactly. Uh, there are actually a lot of probiotics in uh, tequila. So for those of you who are concerned about your, your gut biome, um, it's good for you. All right, <laughs> here we go. Our speed studies round, starting with the first question. Who's the biggest influence on your life that is not a trumpet player? My mom. What is your favorite book? Cien Años de Soledad, 100 Years of Solitude. What's the worst movie you've ever seen? Oof. Oh, I don't know, man. <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I don't, I'm not, a, I can't, I can't recall. I've seen so many bad ones. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I'll pass on that one. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. Uh, if you weren't a trumpet player, what would you want to be? A soccer player. Um, what's your favorite drink? Uh, agua pipa. Coconut water. Uh, you could have a dinner party and you could invite any three living people to attend that party. Who would you want to have? Oh my God, that's a good one. Uh, the, whoever comes out with the with the vaccine of the coronavirus. Okay. Number one, number two, I would love to to talk to 
a former U.S. president, probably Obama, number two. And number three, uh, the people at the ITG. <laughs> they're, such a, they're such a good time. So they're calling by us one. I know it would be our party. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that's for sure. <laughs> okay. Uh, here we go with uh, the next question. Uh, same thing. You're going to have that dinner party. But this time you can invite any three people from history. Ooh, okay, that's an awesome one. All right, the first, foremost, probably I would probably invite JFK. Then I would probably invite, oh man, probably Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln, uh, and probably Caesar. That would be an interesting party. Lots of leaders there. You know, because I would just love to see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> I, you, I, I'm, I'm guessing that you have, so far you have uh, pin, pinned down that I, I like to steer trouble. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I got that. Okay, uh, next question. Lacquer played it or raw? Played it. Okay. What's your favorite quote? Go for art and money will follow. Mm. What is your greatest fear? Wow, that's a good one. Slow death. Mm. No uh, death, not death. Not death, just a slow one. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, you uh, would be granted one superpower. What would it be? Man, this is awesome. I never thought of these things. I guess I never had a childhood. Um, <laughs> a superpower. Uh, knowledge. Okay. Um, what aspect of trumpet playing do you feel is the most overrated? Overrated? Overrated. Fast playing. Okay. What aspect of trumpet playing do you feel is the most underrated? Lung tones. Okay. Um, you're given the ability to go back in time and give your younger self one piece of advice about music. What would it be? Listen. All right. And while you're there, you're going to give yourself one piece of advice about life. Listen. <laughs> <laughs> shut up and listen that's great advice um, and here's the last one what do you want your legacy to be hmm. I, I want it to be two things the number one and foremost I want people to remember me because of the kind of person I am and number two, I would hope to influence people that I have come across and I have had interactions with in a positive way as much as I could. Hmm. Well, you are well on your way with that. Uh, you know, you a tremendous talent on the trumpet um, and you're, you know, a great guy. I mean, from the from the day that we, we met, you know, there. Yeah, I, you were you were just a guy, you know, uh, and that that's I think the thing that that we all want to strive for is that uh, we're approachable and we're we're able to make a difference. So, um, yeah, you know, well, I appreciate I, that, man. You're very kind, and and the same goes for you, man. Yeah, well, you know, I think that you. that it's important that for people to to understand that at the end of the day, man. We are all just people, unless yeah. you found a cure for, for the coronavirus, <laughs> coronavirus, or you find a cure for AIDS, or you know you found the next thing that is going to transform the world. You need to chill out. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's what, yeah. I, that's what I think. Yeah, well, yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, so I know that you have a, a couple of projects in the works. Uh, you have some some stuff that you're doing, um, you know, with with Boston Brass. You have some other things that are going on. Uh, where would people be able to go to find out more about what you've got going on? Yeah, if people can follow me in you know in my Facebook. Unfortunately, my personal fa Facebook, I get people asking for for friendship, but it's full. So, you know, the best way to do it is on the band page, which is Jose Sibaja. And then uh, people can follow me at Jose Sibaja TPT. J-O-S-E-S-I-B-A-J-A TPT in Instagram. And my website, which is Jose Sibaja.com. Oh, Jose Sibaja.com, sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's been it's been tough because I'm from Miami. So in Miami, we always speak Spanish, right? So now I'm here, and it's all all English. But my wife is from Spain, so we speak Spanish. So it's just a disaster. Uh, you're in Nashville; they don't speak English there. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. They're not. They're nice here, man. Yeah, yeah. They're yeah. awesome yeah. people here. Yeah, I you know I, I I have a number of friends that live there, and. Um, it's a great city, and I think and you're you're uh, you're a great asset to that city as well. So, all right. Well, thank you very much for spending some time with me today, Jose. And uh, for those of you who joined us on this episode of The Hang, I hope that you got some great information, and uh, more importantly, I hope that uh, Jose has inspired you to find the joy in your playing uh, and and keep that joy. So as always, thanks for hanging out with us. Peace and slide grease. We're out. Hey, thank you so much for hanging with us today. This podcast is all about creating connection through our mutual love for the trumpet life. I hope that you learned a few things about today's guest and had some laughs along the way. Don't forget to give us a review. We love those five star ratings. And please share this podcast with your friends. We want to see our hang grow for show. Have a suggestion for a future topic or a guest? Hit me up at thetrumpetgurus at gmail.com. Our opening theme was written and performed by Lexi Signor, and all other music comes courtesy of The Greatest Funeral Ever. So in the words of W.C. Handy, life is like a trumpet. If you don't put anything into it, you don't get anything out. So go out there and let your trumpet sound. And I'll see you at the next hang.